try to summarize our efforts in where we are. So essentially what we have developed in cities in the forecasting and control work package is that we have uh, developed a, a package that can um, essentially take uh, uh, forecasts, predictions, it can take consumption forecasts, and we have a number of unit models that we then combine in, in, in GSA Power Hub, or we call it uh, artificial intelligence, we call it uh, uh, digitalization, uh, or even big data. To me, these are all synonyms. They are synonyms for model predictive control. That's the smartness in the smart systems, typically, at least from my point of view. And then this optimization then produces a schedule for the various energy units. Uh, and this has taken a lot of developments in mathematical models, statistical modeling, in optimization algorithms, in the structure of these, uh, uh, of these optimization problems, so that we don't just solve the big, uh, or, the, or one monolithic big optimization problem, but we actually produce a hierarchy. And what I will then talk about or focus on is how we then use that in what we call a smart energy home, where we have electrical vehicles, where we have heat pumps, uh, Scandinavia for heating, and we have uh, uh, the batteries uh, and solar panels. And how would we operate such a, such a system uh, individually and if we have them on an entire road or in, in an entire city? How would we operate? an example of an integrated energy system like that. The roadmap that I have been, we've been using uh, over these 10 years is, is this picture that was produced by the Danish Climate Commission. So essentially it shows very nicely the ingredients that we need to address in order to uh, facilitate the green transition. So what you can see here, you can see in, in the lower left corner, you can see uh, houses with heat pumps, you can see the solar uh, modules, you can see the electrical cars, and then uh, for this part of the, of, of the world, then not, we have a lot of wind energy as well. And there's also a number of other components, but today we will focus on this part here and really show how we, how we operate these. And there are a number of opportunities because even though if you do not have a battery, you can store heat. They have inertia, so you can store that. You can also store heat in water accumulation tanks and uh, refrigeration systems, so that is mainly for supermarkets, but you can also uh, store heat there, such that you actually store uh, the wind energy uh, when, it, when, it, when it's most advantageous. And you can use IT systems to integrate these energy systems. And we have a number of other producers. We have wind turbines, we have uh, photovoltaic solar modules, solar panels, and so on. And uh, if you can forecast these better, you can also control better. And that has been, that has been our goal in, in, in cities uh, to do that. So this is just an example of something much wider. So this was from one of the initial cities figures where we really wanted to operate or be able to operate integrated energy systems. So, so we have the, the, the solar, we have also biomass, and then we have a number of opportunities to convert it, for instance, uh, convert some of the electric some of the electricity by electrolysis to, to, to gas storage and then back by fuel cells. And then we can operate different systems for heating and cooling, cooling for industrial processes or even water treatment. And of course today is the building that we will talk about and how, how we can use these partly as a battery and how we should operate these. What is the smartness? What is the digitalization? What is the artificial intelligence? That is, uh, from our perspective, that's the model predictive controls plays an important role there. And this picture is meant to illustrate model predictive control, so you can see in the You can see this figure here. So this here is the history, the recent history that we have a number of measurements. We fit our model for that recent history such that the model that we have now is adapted to the current situation. Uh, when we have that fitted model, we have also estimated the current states. Then we use that model to predict the near term uh, future. Uh, if we do, do a scenario like that, 
Then we investigate all possible scenarios and we pick the best scenario. Then the principle of marketing and control is that we do not rely on perfect models because we only take the first part here, the first part of our scenario. We implement that and then a period later when we get new information, we update our model and we repeat the procedure. This is the way to get both the optimality and robustness into your system, this the feedback mechanism. And of course, it's based on the premise that you can solve an optimization problem like this very efficiently online and unsupervised. It's also based on the premise that you have models that are sufficiently accurate. So how do we get these models? Many of our models are actually a big part of them are data-based, so they are data-driven. And I just used one example here to show an example of a data-driven model. So we have done a step response to get the model, and then this here would be the transfer function describing this model. It has a time delay, it has a gain, it has, ha, 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 has a time constants. It could also be other models. We convert these, all these models, no matter what, what it is, into stage-based models and then we have MPC that works on these. The features of these models and the way we do it is that they are adaptive, they're data-based, uh, we can combine some model information with, uh, with uh, data information, and we are able to predict both the mean of the future and the uncertainties, and we are able to use that in our MPC. So just to repeat, so we have, uh, we have uh, Henrik and his team has developed very good wind power forecast tools. We have their consumption forecast tools, we have unit specifications, then we have our, we call it power hub, but we have our MPC, and then we use that to schedule the, the components in our energy system. And as we just heard, um, we can bring in a lot of different units, as I've tried to illustrate in this picture, such that this essentially also becomes kind of a virtual power. The way we have then structured uh, some of the things that I will show you now, uh, that is that we have a weather forecast model uh, that we want to control many, many systems. Uh, this is with a picture of wind turbines, but they could also be houses. And then, then we have an economic MPC that essentially provides prices of set points with individual units. The individual units are then controlled by model predictive control technology. We want to do that for, for, for a house, then the components of this house that we are considering now is that we have photovoltaic cells on the roof, we have heat pump, we have a stationary battery, and we have an electrical vehicle with a battery, and we can sell and buy uh, electricity from the grid. So this is the situation we wanted to, or uh, uh, this was what we wanted to do, and we can see that there was a guy in California that was actually also inspired by this vision. So, so his name is Elon Musk. So, uh, so this, is, this is his picture of what we just showed. So, so we actually have solar tiles on this, on this house here. We have the electrical vehicle here. These are the stationary batteries, the Tesla power banks, and you could imagine that we have the piping for the heat pump or, or, or the air conditioning system there in, in, in the lawn. So what is new and what is going to change is that we really need these IT systems to operate in our neighborhood. Well, Elon Musk is not the only one that's going to produce electrical vehicles. Many more of us are going to have these electrical vehicles if we want to be a transition. We are going to see a lot more uh, 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 solar roof tiles, so, so Elon Musk and, and, and some of these companies already had this vision, but we are going to see other producers as well. So we are going to see it in our neighborhoods. And, uh, and heat pumps, not, uh, I'm not sure in Denmark, but at least in South of Sweden where I come from, uh, we have uh, essentially every house has a heat pump. So, so we operate it like that, and you will see these smart meters. So this is the setting, this is the setting we want to optimize for in, in, in this talk, the integrated energy system. And our technology for doing that is then that we have 
very efficient in model prediction control algorithms that we can either implement on embedded electronics like a, a Raspberry Pi, or we can implement them in the clouds, such that we would have a local sensor environment, we would have a database that would, would, would send the data, we would do the optimization there in the cloud, uh, we could send the decision back, it could also communicate with an aggregator uh, when it decided on, it, on its decisions. And from a user point of view, what you would do is that you would set the, temper the maximum temperature that you would allow in your house, or the maximum temperature and, and the minimum temperature that you would uh, allow in your house at, at different times, such that you uh, felt comfortable, and then the system would essentially operate to heat pump the, the battery, buying and selling electricity based on, 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 on the, the, the power produce, production on, on, from the photovoltaic cells and the prices and so on. And it could be that it then produced what would give the temperature profile like this, operating just about your uh, lower limit to, to, to operate this the cheapest way. So what did we do in order to, to actually uh, enable this, uh, uh, this vision? Uh, in cities, we have a number of advances, and here I just list a few of them. But some of the recent ones was that in order to, to do this efficiently, you actually need to have many levels of soft constraints. So, so in the picture, I just show you one, but in the recent paper, it shows that you need multi levels of soft constraints. Uh, uh, to actually formulate meaningful and uh, objective functions. You also need to be very careful and use a concept called the cost of flow function, but that is essentially when you optimize and uh, want to have uh, good objective functions, you need to take into account the value of the energy that is already stored in your system. Obviously, if it's a battery, it's a no-brainer, but it could also be the value of the energy that is stored at, at heat in your system. And the many researchers have got that, and I think that was one of the contributions that we, that we had here in, 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 in cities. We have also come up with relatively simple but, but very useful models for simulation, control, and optimization of these systems and efficient algorithms. What does the solutions look like? So um, in this one, um, this is, this is, this is, this is a, a drawing from, from from some work that Rasmus Halbor did. But essentially here we only have the house with the heat pump. Not the integrated system, but that is just to show you that first. And what you can see here in, in the bottom, then you can see uh, uh, the green curve here. This is the solar radiation. This is the ambient temperature. You can see the electricity price. That is the, that's the green one. That's the electricity price, so it's cheapest here. And then the decision that the model predictive control makes, it decides when to uh, essentially turn the heat pump on. This is here, here, here. You can notice that it's all the times when the prices are cheapest, and such that it keeps the temperature within the bounds that you have specified as a user and does that in the cheapest possible way. And then when you step up one, uh, one step, when you then look at the integrated, energy system. Then you would have the heat pump as before, but you would also have the charging of the battery in the electrical vehicle, and you would have the charging of the stationary battery. And again, uh, you can now both sell and buy electricity. Uh, 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 you can see here, this is how the devices are, are, are scheduled to run. This is the selling of electricity, this is the buying of the electric electricity, and this is the solar radiation. But again, you will see that it actually charges the battery uh, when the electricity is cheap, or we have surplus of it, uh, and it sells when, when you can make a profit of that. So that was a single integrated energy house of this, uh, uh, what we could call Elon Musk type, where you have solar roof tiles, you have electric vehicle, uh, power bank, and you, uh, and you have a heat pump. What if we had an entire street with that on it? So would that be uh, that we used uh, a more Venice representation of this system? That this is from from what in a in a DK calls the right? And we have a Henrik uh, and I have a student now, Christian Silver, that that this did this one. But essentially, just looking at this, first we just put in three houses. So three of these integrated houses, 
How would that look like? And how would that look like if you didn't have a capacity? Because every house on this road could not charge at the, at the same time because you had a capacity. Also, this can be solved, and you can see then we will charge the, the battery essentially when uh, electricity prices are low. I should also say if somebody on the right students, Christian uh, Silver is very motivated, very talented for a PhD, contact him. Like, not because he wants to do a um, PhD in a mature age, but Christian Silver would like to do it in a young age. So, uh, so, uh, but he, he, he has done some of these innovations. He's very talented. Um, we have done previously the similar studies with, with, with Danfoss, where we showed could we use the same techniques for actually scheduling the operation of supermarket uh, refrigeration plants. And again, what you can see here, essentially, when you suddenly have an excess of power, then uh, you can start cooling down the, the, the supermarket to the lower limit because the electricity is essentially free and then you can store and you can use this as a way of saving power. Finally, I want to address how large systems can be addressed with these technologies that we have developed in cities. So I will take a case study that we did with what was at that time called Dong, or Earth, and now today Earthstay, the Danish power company. It was uh, in collaboration with the power company at the Ferry Islands. So the Ferry Islands is a small island group here in the Atlantic Ocean, south of Iceland, north of Scotland. Uh, it's isolated, so there are special uh, challenges in operating their, uh, their energy system. So what uh, we did together with our partners was essentially that we came up with a, a model for the entire energy system of, of the Ferry Islands, including a demand response for some of the uh, bigger co consumers. We developed a system based on some of the economic MPC principles that I have shown to you combined in a smart way with unit commitment. Uh, Dong Energy implemented this system, ran the entire Ferry Island uh, power system for three months. And, uh, and uh, as such, I think this was a major achievement uh, uh, in VP5 of, of cities. What enabled this? One of the things was very fast solvers. So essentially, if, uh, when you need to solve some of these problems, you will get large scale linear programs or other optimization problems. And if you just use some of the standard solvers, this is what I've listed here Mosec, uh, CPEX, Wobi. Uh, these are the solvers you have here. And if you have very many energy units, then uh, the CPU time grows like this. But if you tailor the optimization solver for this problem, then you can, and this is what we reached, then you get the blue one here. And you can see for large systems, it's almost an order of magnitude that you get. So you can certainly solve larger problems. That's on the system level. But you also have the individual uh, individual uh, MPCs. For instance, on a, on a wind turbine where we have sampling times less than a second. But there's also other systems that we needed to address. So this was the other algorithmic invention that we did in cities. So what you can see in this, in this picture, that is essentially the prediction horizon that's an indication of the size of the MPC problem that we run. And then you can see a number of the, the really best solvers. This one here is ours. And it was not, it was actually our competitors that made this study. So, so it was not that I just favored our own solver. But you can see that all the other solvers, orders of magnitude slower than ours. By really being careful about the algorithms, by the implementation, you can speed up such that you can solve things that you cannot do with traditional uh, algorithmic technologies. So just to sum up what we have achieved, uh, MPC technology is now implemented in many systems to enable coordinated and efficient operate, operation of these systems. In, process, uh, in, in projects that was not related to cities but nevertheless very relevant for green transition, uh, we implemented these, uh, some of these MPC technologies for cement processes, for food processes, uh, spray drying with, with FL Smith and uh, gear process engineering. For energy processes, I just showed you an example that we implemented with Rockstay. Uh, I know Vestas has also based uh, their MPCs of the new big turbines, or no, the control of the new big turbines on, on some of the model predictive control technologies they developed in, in 
industrial PhD studies with us. So my, my point here is that MPC technology is now mature and ready to implement it on large scales of buildings, just that we can also in the building sector uh, enable uh, uh, coordinated operation. And we think that MPC is a key technology for that. that at DTU Compute, we have excellent forecasting and statistical techniques, modeling techniques. We have significant, as indicated here, model predictive control technology, and we have the ability and willingness to really combine that and work with energy companies to facilitate this transition. And I think the city has been instrumental in promoting this research and this technology.